What's up, everybody? Happy Thursday to you. It's Clint from the Die Hard MMA Podcast, brought to you by Pub Sports Radio, and this is the Total Takedown. We're going back over the fight card this weekend, UFC Vegas 49, Bobby Green versus Makachev, and we are talking about how long we think these fights are going to last. Instead of picking a fighter or a side, we're going over or under, so if you want my full breakdowns, check out the podcast on Monday. Let's... Get right on into this bad boy. First fight of the night. Uh, a couple of Dana White contender series boys making their debut. Victor taking on Carlos Hernandez. That's right, I'm skipping his last name because I still haven't practiced it. <laughs> uh, this fight is lined right now at two and a half. The over two and a half is minus 180, minus 185. The under two and a half plus 140 uh, to plus 160 in that ballpark for violence if that's where you're looking. And this is a spot where I really think we're probably headed over. I have a hard time seeing either one of these guys finishing. Now, Victor, he's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's going to have the submission grappling edge, but Carlos Hernandez is a wrestler, so he probably will be able to dominate uh, dominate the positions. When they're on the feet, both these guys are kind of volume-based strikers. Nobody with that really next-level power power fight ending crushing striking power or anything like that victor does throw some spinning kicks and stuff like that he's got a chance to maybe finish it and i do think he's got the slightly better gas tank so i think this thing could get hairy deep in that fight about in that third round area because victor potentially can pull off the old club and sub maybe he wins in a scramble and gets a submission if carlos hernandez gasses out and gets tired i'm not counting on victor tiring out so i don't know that a gassed out submission could come from hernandez i guess it's possible but I don't see it personally taking place about the only way I see this fight finishing inside the distance is with a victor submission from bottom and it's lower level these guys are still kind of Dana White contender series guys not really established at the UFC level yet so really anything could happen in this kind of a fight so can't necessarily rule out the under but I do think this one's headed to the judges scorecards or potentially a round three finish once Carlos Hernandez slows down so maybe I sprinkle that round three on Victor but I'm not planning on doing much I lean over the two and a half minus 185 is a little bit steep though Next fight up, Ramiz Brahmaj taking on Michael Gilmore. And this is <laughs> this is a really interesting fight. I cannot wait to see what they end up doing with this one. Total set at 2.5. The under 2.5 is minus 160. The over 2.5 is plus 130. We've got Ramiz, who really is a next-level submission grappler, but he's not a great wrestler. You've got Michael Gilmore, who's a 6-4 and four fighter, a guy that gets tapped out all the time but he actually is a collegiate level wrestler and he's a decent striker. So this is a spot where you'd think Ramiz probably gets the win. He probably slices and dices this guy's a a guard up on the mat once it hits the floor early in round one. But honestly, I think Michael Gilmore is the stronger guy and he's also the better wrestler. So I don't know if Ramiz is going to have the takedown advantage that a lot of people are assuming that he has. I know he can out grapple Gilmore once it hits the mat, but can he get it down there in the first place is the question. This really seems like a Ramiz one round or bust type of situation if he doesn't get it down i don't think he's beating gilmore on the feet i don't think he's beating gilmore if this fight gets extended i do think that gilmore can box ramiz up at range and that would kind of expect this thing to go over so uh, this one's really binary if you think ramiz wins that under two and a half is looking beautiful if you think gilmore wins And maybe if Ramiz can't quite sub him, although why would you think Ramiz is not going to sub this guy? Maybe it goes over. So both these guys can win on the under two and a half. However, I think only Michael Gilmore wins if this thing goes over two and a half. So I'm definitely leaning towards violence here. Michael Gilmore could KO Ramiz in this spot if he lands a good solid shot. There's the concerns of Gilmore, I think, dropping a weight class in this one as well. It's his first time on a full camp, so we really could see a new version next-level Michael Gilmore in this spot compared to what we're used to seeing in the octagon. So, very interesting, really dangerous, lean to violence on the under 2.5 here in this spot. Next up, Alejandro Perez taking on Jonathan Martinez. Uh, I'm big on Jonathan Martinez in this spot. I know I told you guys to go watch the uh, you know the Monday show, and I'm not going to pick a side, but I'm definitely on that side. Total set at two and a half. We got over at minus 165, minus 175. Under is 
in some spots it's even money but i see a couple of plus 130s hanging out there for violence and i do like the violence here in this spot you know alejandro perez is a guy that really knocked off the rust in his last fight he's explosive he's fast he does like to blitz forward so the way he crashes into his opponents you do that car crash thing over and over in a fight of this caliber and you're gonna end up causing somebody to go down this thing's gonna be at a 145 pound catch weight that leaves questions uh perez i believe is the team that is requesting the weight change so we got to feel that maybe he's having some issues maybe his cardio is not holding up because he's got an injury and he can't cut the weight maybe his body is prematurely shutting down I don't know how you could maybe get away with a fight you know this far out if that's the case but you got to wonder about the durability of Perez if they're already asking for the fight to be up a class and honestly Jonathan Martinez is a guy who struggled getting to 135 in the past I think the extra 10 pounds favors him you know if he thinks he's going to make 135 but several days out, he gets to stop his cut and maintain all that water and maintain all that energy and not kill yourself getting down. That's a positive for a guy like Martinez. I don't think Perez is going to have the ability to, you know, grind and wrestle in this spot. Martinez drops a lot of his opponents in the UFC. We've seen Perez get knocked out before. We've seen Martinez get knocked out before. This is a violent spot, in my opinion. Both guys can finish. Both guys can get finished. I think it's Martinez by KO personally, uh, but I do think that there is some upside on Perez to get the finish as well, so violence is definitely a good spot in my opinion. Terrence McKinney taking on Faraz Ziam, and this is another binary one. There's nothing we can do about it. Total set at one and a half. Over is minus 145, minus 150. Under is plus 110, plus 125. And I see there's a couple of uh, two and a halves that are flying around out there. Over is plus 130, under is about minus 175. So really juice to the violence if you're getting that two and a half line. The question is that one and a half spot, right? Terrence McKinney, real wild card here in this spot. Jeez, I, straight out of South Park, McKinney. <laughs> we, uh, we got Terrence coming in here and they put all that pressure on him. All those first round finishes, they keep throwing those you know, uh, graphics up about how quickly he takes his opponents out that first round viral knockout he had. He's going to be coming in here and you got to wonder if he's fallen in love with his hands. He's a wrestler by nature. He's a guy that comes in to out grapple his opponents and he's taken on Faraz a guy with good takedown defense, good fight IQ, but he likes to run away from his opponents, make them chase him and then counter level change, land some point striking type of shots and extend the fight. So we've got one guy that goes under almost exclusively and then we've got the other guy that goes over almost exclusively. So pick your poison here, man. If you think it's going uh, for Aziam's way, take the over and just in case McKinney grapples and can't quite get the sub, maybe you're safely landing on that spot. If you think uh, Terrence McKinney's probably going to win this thing, but there's also the question of him being a little bit chinny. So maybe Faraz, you know, mats him in round two. There's always that chance. Both guys hit the under and finish violence. You could argue either way here, guys. I'm going to go ahead and say over. I'm kind of in the Faraz Ziam uh, side of things myself. I'm not sold on Terrence. He's going to really have to prove it to me. And the fact that he potentially could spend a lot of his time grappling in this fight also lends itself to the over. So that's kind of the way that I'm looking here personally, but I don't feel confident in it at all. This is a real dumpster divey card here, folks. A lot of these fights could go a lot of different ways. Same with this next one. Uh, Josian Nunez has taken on Ramona Pascal. This is a spot where we've got a total set at one and a half in a women's MMA fight. Extremely rare that you get that. Over one and a half, minus 140, minus 150. Under is going to be plus 105 or plus 110, depending on where you're shopping. And this, again, is just super binary because... Josian Nunez has unreal power at this weight class for the women's division. We've seen her knock out a lot of people. We saw her take out Bayam Malecki. Now, Ramona coming into the UFC, making her debut, kind of a big deal around the world right now. First women's fighter out of Hong Kong. Really exciting for them over there, so congrats, guys. But she has fought nobody, absolutely nobody. She's 6-2 and two making her UFC debut and fought nothing but cans to get here. So I have questions about whether or not she belongs here personally. We've never really seen her tested. She's going to have a size advantage, so there's a chance that she could outgrapple someone like Nunez, and that really does seem to be her path to victory. But what she does really well is clinch knees. When she gets on her opponent, she hangs on their neck and their shoulders and fires these big-ass knees to the head and to the chest. 
I could see that being a problem for Josian Nunez if she does gas out from grappling a little bit earlier, if she goes for that KO and doesn't quite get it. Um, I do think there is some slight upside for violence in this spot, but no way in hell am I betting an under one and a half in a women's MMA fight at even money. That just doesn't make sense to me. I do think Josian Nunez is live for an early KO, absolutely, but I don't know that that's the right price or anywhere near the right price. I've got questions about Ramona, but I don't know that she's chinny. So I, I'm going to say over, I, I don't know. I kind of, I really don't like this one guys. Cause I, I'm picking Josian Nunez. I do think that, you know, her hitting harder and having those bombs is really going to what, you know, wins her the fight. But if she wins the fight, she probably does it in round one. And here I am saying over because Ramona Pascal could potentially be durable. We have no idea. Stay away from this total. Probably stay away from this fight. Ignacio Mahamondez taken on Zhu Rong in a fight that has the internet split right now. Total on this one is set at two and a half. The over two and a half is about minus 150, minus 160. Under two and a half is plus 130-ish across the board, it looks like. And again, this is a spot where we've got questions. Zurong is just so young. He's 21 years old. He's making improvements, but he knows how to grapple. Ignacio Bahamondas is a slick, slick striker on the feet. We've seen him have that fight ending power, but it's something that takes a full fight to develop you know he works the legs and works the body and he's not that one hitter quitter type but he just stays in the game until he takes you out of it so is he going to be able to defend the takedowns from Zurong big question is Zurong going to be able to stand with this guy we've seen him be tough and relatively durable but he has a problem with the volume when his opponents just continuously mix up the strikes on him I know there's an argument to be made here for violence but I'm going over I, I really think that the over two and a half at minus 150 is kind of more the play here I think Zu is going to have to rely on that grappling I don't think he's submitting Ignacio Bahamondes and then if this thing does get to the feet I think Ignacio is going to be able to outclass Zhu Rong obviously he's a young kid he can make big improvements but we haven't seen him be you know not durable or anything like that we know Bahamondes can take a shot so if this turns in to a striking match I do think these guys can kind of pick and poke at each other for 15 minutes so I'm gonna say over two and a half but again another one uh, where we can expect leaps and bounds of improvements from both these guys Zhu is 21 Bahamondes is 24 like they're, they're gonna just keep improving if one of these guys shows up and dices the other one I'm not gonna be shocked Gregory Rodriguez taking on Armin Petrosian another really fun fight total on this one set at one and a half over is plus 110 even money in some places. Uh, under one and a half is minus 120, minus 125. And I agree with the violence here in this spot. This is a spot that I can get behind some violence. Uh, 185 pound weight class, so big boys. Uh, Gregory Rodriguez wouldn't look out of place at 205. The dude is massive. And what we've got is a six and one, six KOs, Dana White Contender Series guy stepping into the UFC. So Armin Petrosian only knows how to destroy people and do it early. That's all he's ever done. Gregory Rodriguez, 11-3. and three. Uh, BJJ Black Belt obviously having a grappling advantage here in this spot, but has that big power too. We've seen him put out some people, rocked and KO'd the Iron Turtle clean in his last fight, but he's a liability. His chin gets a little bit cracked as well. We've seen him hurt. We've seen him wobbled. So far, he's been able to pull through it, but he also got KO'd on the Contender Series that one time. So let's not forget, we have seen this guy's chin get cracked before. I think there's a lot of violence upside for both guys. The one loss for Armin Petrosian is a knockout loss. So yeah, I think someone's going to sleep. Gregory Rodriguez can take this guy down, maybe outclass him, maybe sub him. Even if this thing does make it into round two, we've seen how Gregory looks in round two after a full round of grappling. He's exhausted. He cannot manage a pace throughout this fight. So he's going to get an early finish or he's going to be out of it <laughs> as soon as round two starts. And Armin Petrosian has basically made a career of defending takedowns, getting back up and then punching people in the mouth. So I kind of expect that to work here for him. Definitely looking under. Armin Petrosian, I'm sorry, Armin Saryukian taking on Yoel Alvarez. Uh, we've got a 155 weight class here for these boys. And where's my total? They moved this fight on me. Apologies, everybody. 
So what we have got for a total on this one is two and a half. It looks like minus 125-ish to the under, so slightly leaning to the violence. You can get, you know, plus, I'm sorry, minus 105, even money, something like that to the over two and a half in this spot. Um, both these guys, I think, do have some finishing upside. We know Joel Alvarez is just a massive weight bully at this weight class. We know he can hurt people on the feet with those big mitts of his. He's got that submission upside as well. Armin Tsaryukian, however, high-level grappler, high-level uh, scrambler as well. We've seen him stay safe in some very, very dangerous guards on the mat, some UFC-level competition before he's been tested, and he's passed all those tests. So... If you're looking at Armin Saryukian, I mean, I kind of think that it's an over. We don't have any reason to believe that Yoel Alvarez is a guy that's going to give up a sub. We don't have any reason to think that Armin Saryukian has enough power to KO a guy the size of Yoel Alvarez, in my opinion. So I kind of think if there's a finish, it comes from Yoel Alvarez. Maybe not 100% binary. Um, Yoel Alvarez is a really big guy, so... I think his uh, finish is definitely going to be his best chance of victory here. We've seen Armin Saryukin wobbled and rocked on the feet before. No one's been able to fully put him away. But if someone with the size and strength of uh, Yoel Alvarez is able to, you know, land a clean shot on him and, and use that weight, get on top of him, start pounding, I think he can get him out of there. So I am kind of personally leaving, leaning with the violence here. I think that Joel Alvarez, the way he fights, is going to cause some violence in this fight. Maybe there's a chance that Armin can get in there and, and finish Joel Alvarez. Alvarez, so that kind of encompasses that under two and a half for me. Um, but I mean, if you're on Team Armin, you're probably looking over two and a half. So I lean under, not what I'm planning on playing from a totals perspective. Priscilla Cachoeira taking on G Yoon Kim coming up next in a fun banger of a women's MMA fight. Total set at two and a half. This is more like it. Over two and a half is minus 200. Under two and a half, plus 145, plus 150, somewhere in that ballpark. And this is a spot where I think, again, we can absolutely make an argument to look for violence. Jiyun Kim, super rangy, super long, but because of that, she can be a little bit slow. Now, she is fast on her punches. She is slow reloading to defend herself. And that's where someone like Molly McCann was able to explosively close that range and punch her in the face and make her pay for it. I think Priscilla Cachoeira can have some success in that type of an area as well. And she hits probably harder than Molly McCann. I mean, we're not entirely certain, but I think she hits harder than Molly McCann. Priscilla Cachoeira has a lot of knockouts on her record. She's got a couple UFC level knockouts. She hits hard as hell. Both these women, though, very durable. You know, if they get if they get beaten, it's not generally by knockout. What we have seen, though, Jiyoon Kim's got a couple of subs on her record, and Priscilla seems to have a weakness on the mat. So if we're looking for violence, both these women could knock each other out. It, it's possible. The durability kind of takes away from that ever so slightly. But you can also throw the sub in for Jiyoon Kim and make an argument for the fact that she's got an alternative path to victory here. So I'd be looking under 2.5 myself. Not one that I'm getting super excited about because the price isn't great but uh, I will lean that way. Misha Serkinov taking on Wellington Terman in our co-main event slot here. Total set at one and a half. The over is minus 165. The under is plus 140, plus 145. And this is another spot, guys, where I honestly, like, I kind of like violence. We have seen Misha Serkinov slice through people in about 60 seconds. Much higher experienced fighters than a guy like Wellington Terman. I don't trust Terman's chin. I think he's an absolute fade. But he is a young kid. He is training with someone like Glover Teixeira. He's getting that championship level work. So maybe we we see improvements from him maybe he does get better we've seen him swing some big bombs he had sam elby hurt on the feet in his last fight and he's a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt so even though i think misha is levels above this guy on the mat you know maybe wellington Terman as a young black belt is still improving and potentially has the chance to get his way on the floor so uh, i'm gonna go ahead and say that under one and a half at a plus price is probably the way to go it's misha's second fight at 185 we'll see how he looks you know maybe he has a better performance because he's more used to the cut now he's been working with the ufc pi maybe he's older and that cut sucks twice as bad now because it's his second time down and he's not going to be the same fighter either way i definitely think both guys can finish i like the violence upside i'd be looking under one and a half. Islam Makachev taking on Bobby Green for our main event here. And honestly, to this point, folks, there aren't that many totals that I'm very excited about. In fact, I don't think I've actually played a single total so far. I've picked a couple sides. I like a few live dogs here on this card, but I don't have a single totals bet. This is the one, though, that I'm really intrigued by, and I might actually be adding to my card. We've got a total set at one and a half for this spot, and I find that incredibly interesting because Armin Sar uh, Islam Makachev, sorry, I'm mixing up my, uh, my grapplers here. Islam Makachev 
He's been turning into a finisher. You know, him slicing through Dan Hooker the way he did in his last fight, everyone thinks he's just going to do the same thing to Bobby Green. Personally, I believe that Bobby Green is better defensively and better with his get-up game than a guy like Hooker is. I think he has far more chance to last longer in a fight against a guy, even the grappler caliber of Islam Makachev. So I think the over is the play here. Bobby Green always goes to decision. The one time recently he knocked out a guy as a guy coming off the couch who a essentially had one foot in the grave and was already going to retire. I don't think Islam Makachev has the power to knock out Bobby Green. I mean, maybe if he loads up and just lands the perfect shot, but Bobby Green is such a slick striker on the feet. He'd roll off of that kind of thing. I don't see him landing uh, Islam Makachev. I don't see him landing that big of a shot on Bobby Green the way Bobby knows how to, you know, defensively roll with these shots. So I don't see the knockout happening unless it's a ground and pound TKO. And then I think Islam Makachev potentially can land a submission, but I don't think that Bobby Green is a guy that's going to give that up easily. He doesn't get submitted. You don't finish Bobby Green. Like Dustin Poirier was the one guy that was able to do it in recent memory, and that was years ago. So I think we're going to see some minutes here. I think Bobby Green is going to come in, be scrappy. The way he keeps his hands low, the way he jabs at his opponent's body, that actually helps him catch his opponents coming in for takedowns, helps him with the wrestling defense. His get-up game is solid. And again, he is not easy to submit. So even if Islam Makachev is able to get him on the mat, I don't know that he's just going to find the back and choke Bobby Green out immediately in that first round. I would be looking at the over one and a half. I know it's chalky. Uh, I'm seeing minus 175, minus 200 in some places. This is kind of like I talked about last week, and I did not have the guts to go through with it last week. Thank God, because we would have lost immediately on it because of the way that fight went with round one. But this is another spot where I think we can ladder. Uh, we can go over one and a half, lay that chalk, lay that minus 175, get up and over the one and a half, and then the over two and a half is plus 110 or plus 105. So we're saying Bobby Green always goes three rounds. All right, let's get over that to the three rounds. Now we're in the championship rounds. You got plus 175 for over three and a half. You got plus 240 for the over four and a half. And then you've got another plus 250 or so for the fight to go the distance. I think this could be the spot where we go over one and a half, over two and a half, over three and a half, over four and a half, fight goes the distance. We cheer for Bobby every second of that fight but we think it probably goes over just because he's that damn durable. Now, when we get into those championship rounds, that's where it gets hairy because Islam Akachev is a monster and Bobby Green has paced some people with his striking and had them hurt, nearly had them out of there in the third round. So him in the championship rounds is a very dangerous proposition. And also Islam Akachev has shown that he can finish in round four because he just wears on his opponents. I think that the wrestling for Islam Makachev is going to make Bobby Green a little bit more tentative on the feet. And if it slows Bobby Green down just a tad, then I don't know that Islam Makachev is going to be quite ready to crack, you know, in round four that early. So it all comes down to who's got the better gas tank. Islam obviously coming in off a of full camp Bobby Green coming in off short notice so you got to kind of favor Islam there just a little bit but again I will bank on the durability and the submission defense of a Bobby Green hoping that he can survive make this thing competitive and even if it's not competitive at least not get tapped so I'm looking overs all the way here in the main event and I think we might actually pull the trigger on that ladder like we talked about that's the total takedown folks give me a follow at diehard MMA pod on Twitter let me know what your favorite total is here in the comments and we'll see you tomorrow for the undefeated post weigh-in show. Good luck, everybody. Let's roll.